Welcome to Pharma Drama, the channel where we look at the science of healthcare and healthcare products. In this video, we're going to carry on looking at amorphous materials, and in particular, how we characterize them by DSC. Aged amorphous materials in particular have a very characteristic uh, transition in a DSC, which a lot of people think is, <laughs> funny enough, melting. But as we know by now, amorphous materials don't melt, do they? No. So therefore, the peak that we see in a DSC when we heat an amorphous material up can't be melting. Which leads to the question, well, what is it then? If it's not melting, it must be something else. And the answer is, it is. It's going through its glass transition. And also, if it's aging, it's going through an enthalpy of recovery. So two concepts that we need to understand, and we can do that with reference to this diagram, <laughs> which I keep using to explain amorphous materials, and is getting ever more complicated, I have to say. So, if you want to understand how amorphous materials behave in a DSC, get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. It should come as no surprise. I, of course, have got a uh, coffee, and let's make a start. Amorphous materials are great, but if we're going to use them to make medicines, we have to characterize them in some way. The gold standard for characterizing physical form is powder X-ray diffraction, but we can't use X-ray diffraction for amorphous materials because they're not crystalline and therefore they all appear the same. So what can we do instead? There are a number of options, but my preferred one, and this is absolutely nothing to do with the fact that I've got lots of them in my laboratory, is differential scanning calorimetry, or DSC. And in DSC, you heat a material up in temperature uh, and you're looking for changes in phase. In fact, it's measuring how much power a sample requires to go through various phase changes. That's essentially how DSC works. If you want to know more about how DSC works, there's a whole series on the channel, which I shall link to uh, in the description below. So, in principle, an amorphous material is tricky by DSC because, one, they don't melt, <laughs> as I said already in a previous video, although lots of people think that they do. Um, they don't actually go through a change in phase, do they? This is, uh, for an amorphous material at least, super cool liquid in red, uh, and then a liquid in blue. It's gone from liquid to liquid, and so there's no change in phase. In principle, that's enthalpically silent. There should be no uh, peak in a DSC for an amorphous material when we heat it up. But in practice, we do see something in a DSC. So remember that in a DSC, what we are plotting is a difference in power being supplied to our sample and reference on the y-axis, uh, as a function of temperature on the x-axis. And what we will see if we heat a glass up in a DSC is uh, nothing. Then we'll see this funny step and then um, nothing. So this step in the baseline of a DSC is very characteristic of amorphous materials. You'll only see it if your amorphous material is a glass and you started your DSC experiment below the glass transition temperature because this step change is what happens when your material goes through this glass transition temperature. So if you were to start heating an amorphous material in a DSC here, above its TG, you won't see anything. You just see a flat line, this bit, okay? But so long as you've started below the TG, you should see a step change in the DSC baseline. I have to say, <laughs> having uh, interacted with hundreds of students over the years, yes, you'd be amazed at how some students can interpret anything in a baseline of a DSC as a glass transition. You do need to be careful that what you're seeing in your DSC is a true glass transition, not just some random noise as someone's walked into the laboratory or something like that. And there are ways in which you can do that, um, which I will talk about in the DSC um, series, okay? The, the best one is to use temperature modulated. DSC, but don't worry about that for now. In principle, if you heat a glass in a DSC, you should see a step change in the baseline like this. Now, you might say to me, okay, you've got this big fancy diagram for amorphous materials. How can you use that diagram to explain why there's a step change in the DSC? And I'd say that's a really good question. And I'm glad you asked it because 
Otherwise, this video is going to be really short. So the answer is the position of a baseline in the DSC is dependent upon the heat capacity of your sample. It's actually dependent on the difference in heat capacity between the sample and reference, but the reference isn't changing, right? So what this means is, as you've heated your uh, glass up in the DSC, it itself must have changed its heat capacity, and it's the change in heat capacity which has caused this uh, baseline to shift its position. Now, if you're following from what I said on this diagram in a, another video, and the link is in the description below if you want to go and catch up, the slopes of these lines before and after the glass transition temperature are actually proportional to the heat capacity of the material. <laughs> heat capacity meaning how much energy do we need to supply to a material to get it to go up in temperature. So if you think here, below the glass transition temperature, if I'm going up in temperature, I'm going this way, aren't I? I'm having to add energy. Well, I'm only at, if I'm only going from here to here, I've only got to add this much energy. Not very much. After the glass transition temperature, let's say I'm going from here to here. Can you see? Now I've got to add more energy to do the same increase in temperature. So that means the heat capacity of our material has increased because heat capacity is how much energy I've got to add to get it to raise in temperature. So here, I've got to add more energy to get the material to go up in temperature than I have below the glass transition temperature. There's all sorts of reasons why that might be, but the one I like to think of is below the glass transition temperature, when the material is a glass, that's a high viscosity um, liquid, the molecules aren't really able to move in response to a change in temperature. We say the material is out of structural equilibrium. And so the molecules can't really waste any energy that you that you give it by moving around, and hence the system goes up in temperature. Above the glass transition temperature, on the other hand, the material has become a super cool liquid, and if we change the temperature, there is a change in the structure of the molecules. They can sort of vibrate more if you go up in temperature, and so we say the material is in structural equilibrium above the glass transition temperature. And so effectively, the molecules are wasting that energy. You're, you're giving them some energy and they're using it to vibrate or rotate or flop about a bit more. And so they're, they're more wasteful when they've got degrees of freedom than they have when they haven't got degrees of freedom. That's essentially the way I like to think of it. So the heat capacity is changing before and after the glass transition temperature. And that is manifest as a step change in the baseline position on a DSC. Now, one other point to note is it does depend which DSC manufacturer you're using, because um, the DSC has a sample and reference, and you're plotting difference in power on the y-axis, you can do sample minus reference, or reference minus sample. So some DSCs, you'll see a glass position plotted this way, other DSCs you'll see it plotted this way. In mine, it's plotted this way, hence <laughs> I'm drawing it like that. Okay, so just for your reference. But it's always a step change. Right, is that as complicated as amorphous materials get in a DSC, Simon? I hear you ask, and the answer is absolutely not. Things get more complicated, and they get more complicated if your amorphous material has been allowed to relax for a period of time. So, if you take a fresh um, amorphous material and run it in the DSC, you typically see this. If you allow it to sit for a period of time, you might see something like this. And if you leave it a bit longer, you might see something like this. I hope you can see that. The longer I'm leaving the material to relax, the bigger this peak is becoming <laughs> when I heat it up in a DSC. I hope you might also see that if you allowed an amorphous material to relax for quite a long time, you're starting to get um, shapes in the DSC that look like this. This is very easy to misinterpret as melting because it looks like a big endotherm. And then really the only phase transition which gives an endotherm in DSC is melting. So it's very common that people look at that and go, well, my material must have crystallized because there's a melting endotherm. So I need to be clear at this point, that, that may have happened. Your material may have crystallized uh, on storage, but if it has crystallized on storage, melting in a DSC, the, the melting endotherm is always sharp. 
so narrow, because materials melt over a narrow range. If you start to get endotherms, which are broadening out a bit, it's an indicator that something's going on. It can be that your material is impure, crystalline but impure. So that, again, that we'll look at that in the DSC series. Uh, but it can also be because your material was amorphous and it's not melting. Um, and you know it's not melting because we did a video on that, didn't we? The video is entitled, Why Amorphous Materials Don't Melt. So if this is the behavior of an amorphous material in a DSC, it is certainly not because it's melting, <laughs> okay? The question is then, oh, what is it doing, Simon? Stop telling us the material is not melting. Why don't you tell us what the material is actually doing instead, okay? Uh, and I think that's a really good idea. So let's do that. So you'll remember when we make um, amorphous material fresh, the molecules are randomly distributed, highest energy, highest volume. That's the red line up here. And I said, if we hold an amorphous material, glass, at a constant temperature, so we're annealing it, the molecules will slowly move with time and they will always move so that the material becomes more ordered. Less excess energy, lower volume. And we go down this green arrow and that's the process of relaxing. So let's imagine for a minute that our material has relaxed to this point here with the blue arrow. If we take that material and we load it into the DSC, then this is where the properties of our amorphous glass are when we start the DSC experiment. And remember, in a DSC, the x-axis is temperature. The x-axis of my phase diagram here is, it's not really a phase diagram, but thermodynamics diagram, is also temperature. So if we start to heat this up in a DSC, we're going to go in this direction. Okay. So that's what will happen. We start to heat our amorphous material up. It will go from here as we're increasing, adding um, energy. We are increasing the temperature and the material will do this, which is what's given us this baseline. But when we get to the glass transition temperature, it, it will go through its glass transition, but that's the point at which the material has moved from not being in structural equilibrium to being in structural equilibrium. And the molecules have suddenly got degrees of freedom to move. And so they will move. And the question is, where will they move to? They will move back to this line. In other words, this is where they were when we created the amorphous material. But over time, the molecules have moved. They've lost energy and they've relaxed. But in a DSC, it's important this, the DSC is actually providing energy to the sample, isn't it, by heating it up. In fact, the DSC is programmed to supply enough energy to always to keep the material raising in temperature. So when it gets to this point, the glass can take energy from the DSC and it can use that energy to make the molecules more disordered. And it will go up this line, back to this point, and then it will carry on up this line. So this position here corresponds to this. This one here corresponds to this, okay? But importantly, an aged material jumping up here, the system is taking energy from the DSC. So if a system gains energy, that's endothermic, isn't it? Exo means giving out, endo means taking in. So the system has taken in energy, which on a DSC is going to manifest itself as an endothermic peak. So essentially what happens for an aged glass is that you have your glass position step in the baseline and you have an enthalpy peak because of this jumping up here. And so because the system is recovering back to where it started from, this is called the enthalpy of recovery. Okay. So what we see for an age glass in the DSC is actually the glass transition change in baseline plus this peak, which is this gap here. And so we see this complicated looking affair here. It's the change in baseline and there's a peak. Okay. Can you see why then, as we age the material more, the DSC data start to look like this? I'll give you a second. Think about that. Look at my diagram. Got it? Yeah. What is happening if we've allowed our material to age more? We've come further down this green line, haven't we? So age further, let's say we've gone to here. So when we heat up in the DSC, we do this, 
when we get the glass transition temperature, we're going to snap back. But now, that difference is bigger, isn't it? Which means that this entropy of recovery peak gets bigger, which means we see a bigger peak here. Okay. So what happened is, if we run our um, amorphous material in the DSC, and it's a fresh glass, we'll see this. If we've allowed it to age for a period of time, we'll see a peak as well as the shif shift in baseline. And that peak will get bigger the longer our material has been aged. And also, if you can see that, therefore, if we've got a glass that's been knocking around for quite a long time, this peak can get quite large. It really does start to look like an endothermic melting. <laughs> I can see why people misinterpret it. Um, but you know now from this graph, that's not what's happening. It's the enthalpy of recovery. So that's going to make you a DSC expert um, right there. So that leads me to a couple of points that I want to say before we um, finish this video. One is that and you might be ahead of me on this one already, you might say to me, well, OK, if this peak is getting bigger with time as our amorphous material is um, relaxing, can we use these data to measure the rate at which the material is relaxing? That's a great question. <laughs> so if you've got to that point by looking at these data, that is very, very, very well done. We can absolutely do that. We can measure the area under these curves and from those areas we can calculate the rate at which the material is relaxing. I'm going to talk about that in a separate video because it's way too complicated to get into um, now. So that's one. Another thing you might say to me is, well, hang on a minute then. In a DSC, if I've got an aged glass and I heat it up and I see something like this, What would happen if in my DSC I stopped heating at this temperature, I cooled it back down again, and then I reheated? That's a good question, isn't it? And the answer is, and to be fair, I always tell people, that think about how you've designed your DSC experiment. Can you get more information by changing the heating rate? Can you get more information by reheating the same sample? In this instance, you totally can get a lot of information by reheating your sample. If you allow your uh, material to cool back down and then reheat it, you will see this. Why? <laughs> Why do you think on cooling and reheating you see a straightforward glass transition by DSC? The answer is, the answer is, the answer is on the graph, isn't it? The answer is on the graph. We started, oh, let's pick this one. We started here, the material's aged a bit. We've heated it up in a DSC, that's this bit. When we've got to the glass transition temperature, there's a change in heat capacity, which has caused the shift in baseline. There's also been an entropy of recovery as the material has jumped back to its position of equilibrium, which is this peak, and then we carried on heating it, which is this bit. If we cool it back down in the DSC, we're not taking it out, we're just telling the DSC, cool it back down and then reheat it. What will happen is stop, the instrument will cool back down. Where is it going to go? It's going to go back on this line, isn't it? Because <laughs> it's the same as when we formed it. So it's going to come down and back on this line. In other words, by heating it up in the DSC and allowing our material to recover the energy it lost on relaxation, when we cool it back down again, it's formed a fresh glass. <laughs> so now we're on this line. If we then stop and reheat, we're just going to carry on back up this line. We'll go backwards and forwards along this line. There is no entropy of recovery because the material hasn't had time to lose any energy, so there's nothing to recover. And so we just get a clean glass transition. If you were to cool it back down in a DSC, leave it for a few hours and then heat it back up again, yeah, it's likely that in those few hours the material has lost some energy and we'll see this peak start to grow again. Okay? So if you're looking at some data in a DSC and you think, right, I think my material is amorphous and I'm looking for a glass transition, and you see this, one, don't panic. Two, don't say it's melting, because it's not melting. <laughs> Three, think to yourself, I'm pretty certain that the material is amorphous, but there's a funny peak there, I don't know what it is. Just heat your material up, because then it will have recovered. Cool it back down and reheat. If it's an amorphous material, you'll see a glass transition. And not only that, you'll look like an amazing expert to anyone that you show the data to, because no one else can interpret this stuff, but you're like, oh, I know what's going on here. This is an aged glass. Now it's a fresh glass. And you'll look like a DSC guru. So that's really good. Okay?
I hope that makes sense. <laughs> you can do other stuff in the DSC, you know, like um, modulated temperature DSC and all sorts of complicated things. But this is a really simple thing that you can do for any glass in a DSC. Just heat it up, cool it back down and reheat it. It takes a couple of minutes and yet it makes your interpretation of the data so much stronger. I hope you can see where these peaks are coming from. They're all coming from this thermodynamics graph over here. Excellent. Right, cool. That's what happens to a glass in a DSC. I hope you found that useful or interesting, preferably both, and hopefully neither. Either way, whatever you thought of the video, would you please hit the like button and consider subscribing because that really helps the channel's uh, metrics. Other than that, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you again soon.